why did the European colonies in uh, North America not remain European colonies? Well, first we have to talk about the fighting among the Europeans. Clearly, Spain, France, Holland, and England were all rivals for, the colonial, for colonial power. Spain was shoved out uh, rather early because the Spaniards never succeeded in developing the kind of uh, ocean commerce that the English were so good at. The Spaniards used to say that we are land fighters, not sailors. And the, after the defeat of the Armada, they never did develop a navy capable of competing with the British and driving the English from the seas. England ruled the, the transatlantic commerce. And so the Spaniards were content to concentrate on the areas in which they already were, were uh, popular, uh, where they already owned Mexico and Central America and Latin America, and uh, were out of the North American picture pretty much rather early. The Dutch were forced out by the British who won the War of 1860 against the Dutch and took New York, New York in 1664. Uh, Dutch colonial possessions in North America were limited to uh, Dutch Guiana, now known as Belize, and a couple of other minor places. The French were another matter. The French, with their cordon of settlements in Canada and down the Mississippi Valley, were a great challenge to the English colonies. And in 1756, Britain and France went to war. The colonial rivalry was not only in North America, it was also in India, where the French and English were vying. And the War of 1763, 1756 to 1763, which we in America known as the, know as the French and Indian War, known in Europe as the Seven Years' War, was actually the First World War. It was really a war between England and France to decide who was going to be the great colonial power in England and in North America and in India. And England was triumphantly victorious in that war. The great year was 1759 when William Pitt, who was the Prime Minister of England, sent an expedition under James Wolfe to North America, sent him down to St. Lawrence to conquer the, the French settlement at Quebec and conquer France in North America, conquer the French possessions in North America, and break that French cordon. And Wolfe, although he lost his life in the fighting, succeeded in doing just that. Since 1759, Canada has been English. And in fact, the secession of Quebec right now is, is directly a result of Wolfe's conquest of 1759 when the French-speaking province of Quebec was conquered by the British and has remained British uh, ever since, British-controlled or Canadian-controlled ever since. Also, the events of 1759 uh, were also associated with the march of uh, General Washington, a colonial uh, Virginian, who was an aide to General Braddock, the Englishman who was sent to America to conquer the French forts in Pennsylvania at what is now Pittsburgh, the head of the Ohio River. Fort Duquesne. Braddock lost his life, but Washington succeeded in saving the army. Uh, the French and Indians defeated Braddock at that time, but Washington later took the fort, and the Ohio, the head of the Ohio, became English also. Well, the Seven Years' War was a very vicious war in England, uh, in Europe rather, as well as in North America, and it cost a lot. And when the war ended in 1763, the British Treasury was pretty much emptied. Parliament, sitting in London, realized that one of the major beneficiaries of the fighting of the Seven Years' War, had been the English settlers in North America, who had been freed from the possibility of the French uh, controlling them and from the menace of Indians' attacks supported by the French. And so Parliament thought it was only fair that those English colonists in North America should pay some of the cost of the war, since, after all, they benefited from it. And Parliament passed the Stamp Act. The Stamp Act was a law that provided that every time a legal document was signed, a will, a deed, a transfer of property, a contract, it had to bear a stamp, which had to be purchased from the royal authorities at a fixed price. This was absolutely ruinous to a commercial society such as New England, where contracts, trades, deeds were uh, everyday things. It wouldn't have impacted the South so much because the Southerners had less need for that kind of commercial transaction. They did most of their trading directly with England. The ships would come right up the river to the plantation, load the goods on, load the cotton on, and, uh, and off they go again. But in the North, uh, in New England, a commercial society, the Stamp Act was ruinous. The British government, in other words, in 1763, made the same mistake that the Spaniards had made when they were trying to subdue the Dutch 100, 200 years before. The Spaniards imposed the kind of tax that the Dutch, a commercial republic, could not accept. And that would provoke the rise of the Dutch Republic. The same thing happened in North America. The Stamp Act produced howls of protest from the colonies. And Parliament listened to a point. Parliament revoked the Stamp Act, but also passed something in its place called the Declaratory Act. 
which stated that Parliament was only revoking the Stamp Act because it wanted to, not because it was forced to. The Parliament had the power to do anything it wanted to do. At this time also, a new monarch came to the throne in England in 1760. George III, the third of the Hanoverian kings. The British monarchy had uh, run into trouble in 1715 with the death of Queen Anne, who had uh, no survivors. And they were looking for a Protestant succession in Britain. They didn't want to have a Catholic steward on the throne. And so they brought George I, the German Prince of Hanover, to England to become King George I. George, however, couldn't speak English, which was a little bit of a difficulty if you had to be the king. And so instead of having to do his own work, he had a prime minister in Parliament work for him, Robert Peel. And it's the uh, tradition of the Parliament that the prime minister is now the, the leading figure in the government. George III, who definitely did speak English, and whose mother was very much a royalist, was raised from child with uh, a mother who told him, George, be a king. And George felt that this meant that he should be his own prime minister, or at least boss his prime minister, have a faction in parliament that would support him and take an active part in the governing of the British Empire. You know, today and for many years, the sovereign of England rules, reigns, but does not rule. Reigns, but does not rule. George III tried to form a party in parliament to give him active rule of the country. And his minister was Lord North, his prime minister, and his colonial secretary was Lord George Germain. George III, unfortunately, was not a very wise and far-seeing man. He was well-intentioned, but he wasn't very smart. And all he could see in the colonial rantings against the Stamp Act and against the Declaratory Act was basically reaction against him and the authority of his government. He didn't see that the colonists had special problems that were different from England's, and he did not for a moment think that they had any rights whatsoever to challenge his authority. And so, in place of the uh, Stamp Act, Parliament passed a series of acts urged by the king and his ministers, including one called the Tea Act, which is an attempt to dump tea on Boston. The colonists weren't having any. One of the reasons why they particularly disliked the uh, new authorities was that the British monarchy was attempting to clamp down on the smuggling that was going on in New England. That is to say, trade carried on without paying the taxes. One of the leading smugglers was John Hancock, who was one of the richest men, if not the richest man, in Massachusetts. And the colonials felt that uh, they were being stepped on by the royal authority. The royalists felt that the colonials were simply a bunch of uh, smugglers and uh, ne'er-do-wells uh, challenging the rightful authority of the king. One of the most interesting things to do is to read the history of the American Revolution seen from the British perspective, because it certainly doesn't read like what you read in school uh, about all those heroes in Massachusetts. Uh, they weren't necessarily heroes, depending on if you're looking on the other side of the coin. At any rate, things in Boston got worse and worse. The British ported troops in Boston to suppress the city, close Boston Harbor uh, to you know, the trade because the, country, the colony had been rebellious. And among the troops stationed there in 1770, in the winter of 1770, 1771, some of those British troops got into a snowball fight with some of the uh, colonial bad boys. And the British officer in charge either lost his head or, or panicked, or the troops panicked, and fired on the, the crowd. And I think five people were shot. An American publicist and ne'er-do-well author named Sam Adams, who never really did anything much in his life except raise trouble, turned this, in, by rabble-rousing pamphlets, into the Great Boston Massacre and raised a terrific protest organized against the king seeking independence. It so happened that the British troops and by an American lawyer named John Adams, later to be president of the United States, but that didn't change Samuel Adams and his friends who were trying to stir up a rebellion and use the, quote, Boston Massacre, unquote, uh, very well indeed. They also started something else, committees of correspondence, in which writers in one colony would communicate with writers in another to establish a uh, concerted action against the British government in London. And in 1775, they formed the Continental Congress, which grew out of the committees of correspondence. In 1775, the British took action. They chased Sam Adams and John Hancock and a supply of arms, which they had heard that the colonials had uh, stored up in Lexington and Concord. The British marched out from Boston in April of 75. And of course, you know the story about how Paul Revere went out to war in the colonists. Well, Paul Revere got about six blocks and uh, the British caught him. And that was the end of his ride. But uh, much less uh, known figures named William Dawes and Samuel Prescott 
actually did get out to Lexington and Concord and warn Hanco Hancock and Adams that the British were coming. And the colonial militia got together, and when the British arrived at Concord Bridge, they got into a fight, a firefight. They were actually shooting. And all the way back to Boston, as the British marched back, they were attacked by colonials from behind stone walls. This was before the revolution had actually uh, legally begun. There wasn't a revolutionary war technically begun yet, but it was the actual beginning of the war in terms of fighting. Also in that same year, 1775, the British troops in Boston, under the command of General Howe, attempted to storm a party of Americans holding Breed's Hill in North Boston. Well, they stormed it all right, and the Americans ran out of ammunition and eventually had to surrender. But the British suffered so many casualties that it scarred uh, uh, General Howe from then on. And while the British won their objective, uh, it went down in history as the Battle of Bunker Hill, it wasn't fought on Bunker Hill. <laughs> and the only reason the British really won was because the Americans ran out of ammunition. But at any rate, the war had now begun. It was too late to stop it by diplomacy. The Massachusetts Committees of Correspondence turned into the Continental Congress, which declared a boycott of British goods throughout the colonies and the Revolutionary War was underway. In the 18th century, we're talking about how the English colonies began to revolt against the authority of the crown and against the authority of parliament. The first revolt was against parliament's authority. The argument was that parliament was represented only, represented only people in England because the colonists didn't vote for representatives in parliament and therefore should not have the right to tax the colonies. The English answer to this was that not everybody in England was represented either, because only a very small percentage of the English population could vote for Parliament, and the Parliament was uh, elected largely from uh, ancient boroughs, which are frequently known as rotten boroughs, where there might only be a few voters, uh, so that the idea of Parliament was virtual representation, not real representation, not that everyone voted, but that Parliament was supposed to represent the interests of everybody in general, not specifically uh, of one voter to one uh, parliamentary seat. This answer did not to do well for the colonists, people like Samuel Adams and others, who argued that virtual representation was no representation at all, and that the colonial legislatures, which had grown up because of that distance between England, the Atlantic Ocean to the, uh, to the colonies, that the colonial legislatures were the proper authority under the crown. This, in fact, is the way the parliamentary system evolved in Canada and Australia and other areas of the world, which still represent, uh, still recognize, at least in, uh, in theory, the allegiance to the crown, but had their own self-governing parliaments. This was the model that the colonists of 1760 were proposing. And it might have been adopted had the British been willing to accept that. But uh, Lord North, Lord Germain, and King George were not willing to accept the uh, local authority. And as Sherlock Holmes said in one of his most famous passages, I hope that the blundering of a monarch, folly of a minister and the blundering of a monarch will not separate our two countries forever, to paraphrase Holmes. But the British, in other words, were not willing to accept a local authority under the crown. The next step, once the colonists had begun the war, was to attack the authority of the crown itself, the only thing left that most Americans recognized uh, as a tie to England. Once the uh, authority of Parliament was, was resisted, the question was about the authority of the crown. And it was to challenge the authority of the crown that they asked Thomas Jefferson to write a Declaration of Independence. This was in 1776, after the war had already been on for a year, when representatives from the colonies met in Philadelphia to decide what to do next. Roger Sherman, who was one of the great names you never heard in American history, got up on the 2nd of July and said, let's stop fooling around already. We all know what we're here for. These colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states. I move that we vote independence immediately. And on the 2nd of July, 1776, Congress, the Continental Congress, made up of representatives from the 13 colonies, all voted for independence. July the 2nd, Independence Day. What? You said something about July 4th? Well, we celebrate the wrong day, because the vote in Congress was actually on July the 2nd. Why do we celebrate the 4th? Well, after the vote by Sherman, the Congress appointed a committee of five, including Sherman, Benjamin Franklin, and Jefferson, to write a Declaration of Independence which would explain to the authorities in England and to people all around the world why the colonists were taking this radical step. The committee, realizing that Jefferson was by far the best writer on the bunch, gave him the job of drafting the declaration. And Jefferson wrote it, and then July 4th reported it back to the Congress, which approved Jefferson's draft. And that's what we actually celebrate on the 4th of July, not the vote for independence, not the proclamation of independence, but the approval of Jefferson's draft of a declaration of independence. 
That's what we really are celebrating when we celebrate the 4th of July as Independence Day. If you look at the Declaration of Independence, it's a very peculiar document. Most people have probably never read it through. They read the first part, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bonds which are connected into another. And then they read the end, we pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor, and they don't read the middle, because the middle is a lot of gobbledygook to modern, modern uh, eyes. Well, what Jefferson was doing was applying the principle of the syllogism. He realized that by this time, the, uh, the thing that he was attacking was the authority of the crown. Therefore, he had to find a reason, he had to find reasons why Americans should rebel against the authority of the crown. He found them in the English writer John Locke who had been charged with a similar problem in 1789 when the British threw King James II out. James II was a Catholic, and the Parliament and the people of England, who were largely Protestants, simply could not tolerate James II with his uh, Catholicism and his expenditures. And they threw him out and replaced him on the throne with William of Orange brought over from Holland. To justify this, John Locke was asked to come up with a way of uh, giving the, the people of a country the right to overthrow a king who claimed divine right, claimed authority by divine right. Locke came up with the idea that a king rules only through a social contract. Locke's idea was that the people of, this, of the country are the ultimate authority and that they band together and make a contract and appoint a ruler, or allow a ruler to rule over them for their own protection. But that when the ruler no longer provides them with the protection to which they are entitled, in other words, doesn't keep up his part of the bargain, or when that ruler becomes tyrannical over them and exceeds his authority as a contracted for practitioner, therefore that the, then the people of the country have the right to replace that sovereign with another. And Locke wrote this long defense of the revolution of 1689, the so-called bloodless revolution in England, to, de to defend the action of Parliament in deposing James II and sending him to exile and putting William I on the throne, William, uh, William of Orange. Jefferson and all the other founding fathers were very familiar with the ideas of John Locke and the social contract. And if you read the Declaration of Independence, what Jefferson says is, the present monarch of Great Britain has failed to live up to his responsibility to protect his subjects in the colonies for the following reasons. And the whole middle of the Declaration is one reference after another to things which George III is accused to have done to his subjects or not done on their behalf. Some of those things are very hard for us to understand today. We don't know what Jefferson is talking about because we obviously are not uh, people of the times. But if you were an American in, the, uh, in 1776, you would know what each of those incidents was that Jefferson was referring to. They have to do with quartering troops, for example, uh, without the authority of the local, uh, local people. They have a claim tyranny. They claim that the, the king was, uh, did not extend his protection to the, his subjects who deserved it. Uh, one claim after another, that's something like 25 claims that Jefferson makes that George III has violated the social compact. And thus, the conclusion, if the, if the, uh, if the premise is the king must be a ruler uh, to benefit his subjects, and the second premise is this king has failed to live up to his obligations, the, suddenly, the logical conclusion is this monarch no longer deserves to be our sovereign and we have a right to depose him. be deposed in favor of another. Jefferson was arguing that a sovereign might be deposed in favor of no other sovereign whatsoever, but rather an independent republic. And that's what the Declaration of Independence does. The Declaration is a destroying document. It does not create a government. It destroys the existing government and substitutes nothing for it. And after the issuance of the Declaration, the question was, if the British won, what would happen to all those revolutionaries? As far as the British were concerned, there were a bunch of uh, rabble-rousers who had uh, 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 attacked the royal authority and deserved to hang as traitors. And that's why uh, Franklin once said, if we don't hang together, we will certainly hang separately, because they would have been hanged as traitors to the crown had the Americans not won the Revolutionary War. So it was a very uh, daring and uh, a very courageous thing that Jefferson and the others did in declaring that they no longer needed not only this sovereign, but any sovereign whatsoever, that they had a right to choose a Republican government for themselves. When you think about it, this was the first time anybody had ever tried this, 1776. It's before the French Revolution. The French Revolution took its ideas from the Americans. 
Now, the, even the English Revolution of 1689 or the English Revolution of 1649 when they ex executed King Charles I didn't go that far. Uh, in 1649, indeed, they deposed Charles in favor of the, uh, the uh, Commonwealth of, under Arthur of Cromwell, but that only lasted 12 years and then uh, resulted in the restoration of the monarch again. But what Jefferson and his people were doing was not only really de declaring that the divine right of kings no longer had any uh, impact, but that they had the right as individuals to get rid of any king whatsoever. Kings were simply for the servants of the people, as we now, uh, now think our government is supposed to be. So Jefferson and his radical declaration of independence were big news in 1776. It wouldn't have meant anything had the colonials not been able to win the war. And that was another proposition altogether. Why did a powerful empire, who extend, which extended uh, so much around the world that the sun literally never set on it, why did this great empire not succeed in subduing th three million rabble-rousing colonists, many of whom didn't want independence at all? We like to think in America that uh, the, the uh, Revolutionary War was a wholehearted struggle against tyranny. And that everybody in the colonies wanted independence and, and uh, wanted to escape the tyranny of the king. Well, don't you believe it? No less an authority than John Adams was quoted as saying at the time, wrote in one of his uh, diaries at the time, no more than a third of the people in the colonies want independence. One third of them don't want independence. Literally, uh, are Tories who want to remain under the uh, authority of the crown, and one third don't care a whit, one way or the other. And he's undoubtedly right. Not only were the Tories a ponderable military force in the Revolutionary War, after all, all those troops who, uh, who fought on the British side weren't all brought over from Germany and England. Many of them were local American Tories who volunteered to fight for the king. Not only that, but when revolution was finally won and independence was declared and the, the British authority ended, a large number of American Tories literally picked up and left their homes and moved to Canada in order to remain under the authority of the British crown. They didn't want to be independent. They didn't want to be independent so much that they were literally living, uh, willing to give up their lives and homes, give up their homes and property, rather, and move in order to remain British. And that's the origin of the English settlements in, uh, in eastern Canada today. Those people were largely were American Tories who moved north after uh, the revolution was won. So the Revolutionary War was not an effort on the part of the colonies to begin with. Nor was it so uh, crucial to the British. After all, the British Empire was a very powerful uh, institution. It had the, perhaps the, the greatest military force in the world at that time, and the, certainly the greatest economy in the world. So why didn't the English succeed in putting down the revolution? Well, there were a couple of reasons, one of which was Lord George Germain and Lord North. The king's ministers were not particularly able men. Germain, in particular, uh, was a gambler and a socialite and a social climber who thought it was more important to uh, go to the right parties in London than it was to uh, worry about things in the woods of North America. And so there was no real uh, concerted, uh, heartfelt effort from the British leadership to uh, control the colonies. Many of the troops sent to the colonies were actually hired soldiers, Hessians from Germany. You know about the, the Hessians at Princeton, uh, who were very willing to not only not fight, but join the Americans if the occasion arose. After all, they were just hired soldiers, and uh, they had no particular heart in the, uh, the struggle against the revolution. Secondly, I mentioned Admiral, uh, rather, uh, General Howe a moment ago, and General Howe in the Battle of Bunker Hill. General Howe was awesomely impressed by the Americans at Bunker Hill. Sure, he managed to drive them off the hill after they ran out of ammunition, but they inflicted such casualties on him that at a time when manpower was very short, he was very much afraid to assault American positions again because he knew what those riflemen could shoot and that the cost in manpower would be extremely high. And he was anxious to restrain his casualties. So he was unwilling to, attack, to make many frontal attacks on George Washington's army. Washington, of course, uh, was appointed commander of the army by the uh, Continental Congress, took over command of the American troops. He never had very many troops, never more than about 15,000 or so. And George Washington was a peculiar general. He never won a battle. George Washington was appointed the commander-in-chief of the American army by the Continental Congress. He was probably the richest man in the colonies at the time and uh, had military experience fighting with the British uh, and the colonials against the French in the you know, Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War. He was a peculiar general. He never won a battle in the entire war. Every battle he fought, he lost, except the last one, the Battle of Yorktown. 
But Washington also was something else unusual. He had great force of character. He was able to keep his army in being, and he was able to, if he lost battles, still remain a ponderable force uh, despite the losses and to keep his army together. And that itself was a terrific accomplishment. As long as that army existed, the British could not say that they, could, that they had controlled North America. In 1777, Lord George Germain was presented with a plan of action for the year. It was devised by a general named John Burgoyne, who was known as Gentleman Johnny, who, among other things, was a great amateur, amateur theater buff, uh, loved to put on plays. I don't know what kind of a commander he was, but he was an imaginative man. And Burgoyne came up with a plan. His force was stationed in Montreal, and he suggested that he march down from Canada and cut the the uh, New England colonies off from the west. At the same time, he suggested that Howe come up from New York, where he was, uh, up the river from New York, and meet Burgoyne somewhere around Albany and complete the isolation of New England, which could then be conquered easily because it would be cut off from supplies from the west, and the British had already blockaded Boston Harbor. Once New England was conquered, then it would be easy to conquer the middle colonies, and the revolution would be over. Howe liked that idea. And, uh, on the other hand, he couldn't afford to let Washington's army run around by itself. He had to keep Washington in, uh, in control. And he didn't have the manpower to do what Burgoyne had suggested and follow Washington, too. So Howe agreed to the plan under the proviso that he get a reinforcement of about 15,000 men. And so they drew up the plan, and Burgoyne presented it to Lord George Germain. And Germain said, oh, that's great, wonderful, we love the plan, except for one thing. He couldn't afford the 15,000 troops for Howe, and so he simply didn't send them. And he sent a note to Howe saying, you will not be reinforced. Howe then had to choose between following Washington or going up the, the uh, Valley of the Hudson, and he decided he'd better stay with Washington's army and uh, keep Washington from getting into mischief. There was nobody to tell Burgoyne when he started marching down from Canada that there was no army to meet. That he was planning to meet up around army. That army of uh, Albany, that army didn't exist. And so Burgoyne came marching down the lakes in the fall of 1777, took Fort Ticonderoga, but the further he went from his base, the more difficult it began uh, to be for him to move. The woods were very thick, there was no transportation, there were no roads, he had a big force to feed, he couldn't feed them, and he couldn't make much progress. He got stalled in the woods of northern New York. He sent out a foraging party over to Bennington in Massachusetts to bring back food. But they He was also supposed to have another force coming down from Lake Ontario through western New York, which was supposed to meet him and uh, reinforce him. But that force was set upon by a bunch of German-American farmers under Nicholas Herkimer and destroyed. And so Burgoyne was isolated. And on all sides of him, more and more colonials came out of the woodwork with their rifles. And when he got to the area around Saratoga, New York, in October of 1777, he became not only uh, an immobilized force, but an inferior force. And he tried to fight a battle to win his way out, and he lost. And on October 17th, Burgoyne surrendered his entire army. That would not have been as significant as it turned out to be, but for one major factor. In Paris at this time, the United States Continental Congress had sent Benjamin Franklin, a very wise and savvy old gentleman indeed, who was very popular with the French ladies, among others, to negotiate a treaty with the French. The French were no friends of republicanism and revolution, but they were even less friends of the British monarchy. Anything that hurt Britain, France liked. And when the news came from Saratoga that Burgoyne had been forced to surrender with his entire force and demonstrated that the colonials might actually win this thing, the French government signed a treaty with Franklin in which the French agreed to, to send not only monetary support, but also troops and ships to support the American colonial cause. One of the reasons why the British were so dominant and we were expected to win so easily was that the, the colonies had no navy. The British could land troops anywhere they wanted and pick them up wherever they wanted. But now the French agreed to send a fleet to fight the British fleet and to take away control of the water from the British. And that was an enormous, enormous step for the colonists to take. Also, the French army came over. What people don't realize is that when Washington uh, surrounded Lord Cornwallis at, at Yorktown in 1781, he was able to do it for two reasons. One, the French fleet kept the British fleet from rescuing Cornwallis. And second, the army which Washington commanded was half French. <laughs>
under the command of the Comte de Rochambeau, a French nobleman, there were seven divisions of French army troops uh, around Washington's, uh, uh, together with Washington's troops, around Cornwallis's fortifications. And when Cornwallis surrendered on October 19th, 1781, uh, he handed his sword to Rochambeau, knowing very well who beat him. Rochambeau handed it back and said, give it to Washington. A wonderful gesture on his part. But uh, Cornwallis was very much aware, as, as everyone, everyone else was, that these ragged colonials could never have won the war without the help of the French. But they did get the help of the French, and one of the reasons they did was because they won that key victory at Saratoga, which they did indeed win on their own, with the help of Lord George Germain. The Treaty of Paris, which granted American independence, was signed in 1783. And on this continent, we had brought forth a new nation, conceived in liberty, and as Lincoln said some years later, dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Or was it really? Well, all men, as long as they were white Anglo-Saxon property owners, that doesn't apply to women, slaves, or Indians, or others uh, uh, who need not consider themselves quite equal. But at this point, I think we begin one of the major themes in American history. And that is the expansion of the rights that belonged only to white Anglo-Saxon property holders in 1780 to people of every kind every sex, every background, and every station in life. One of the key themes in American history is the expansion of those ideas, which originally applied only to a few, and attempting to apply them to everyone. It's one of the great things about the history of this country. No one has ever tried anything like it before. To take a country is so diverse, so completely, uh, uh, so many different origins, so many different kinds of people, and attempt to give them all the same rights. And, and uh, we haven't always succeeded, it's taken 200 years and we still aren't there. But this is what I talk about when I say, how can we do what we're, where we're going and where we are if we don't know where we've come from? And this is definitely one of the themes that, uh, that we have to talk about in American history. The war was over. How should we run the country? 13 colonies all started in different ways, different backgrounds, all jealous of each other. Uh, certainly the southern colonies were not too happy with the northern colonies. The northern colonies didn't particularly like some of the southern colonies. And some of them didn't like anybody. Rhode Island, for example, really didn't like anybody else. So how to run the country? Well, they drew up something called the Articles of Confederation, which was exactly what it says, a confederation of independent colonies. There were 13 nations in North America, English-speaking North America at this time, and they all confederated for the purpose of uh, making a more convenient way of controlling all of them. But they were very jealous of their sovereignty, and they didn't want to give up very many rights to each other. They had just defeated a strong central government in Britain, and they didn't want to be tyrannized again. And so the Articles of Confederation left out two things. There was no central strong executive. There was no president. And secondly, the Continental Congress, under the Articles of Confederation, became the United States Congress, had no power to levy taxes. Now, any first-year student in government can tell you that a government that can't tax is no government at all. Because the power that really matters in government is the ability to raise and spend money. You can pass resolutions, you can draw up pretty sounding speeches, you can declare rights, you can do anything. But it doesn't mean a thing if you can't raise money and spend money. And the Continental Congress could not do this. It could only ask the states for money. And the various states could say yes or they could say no. Without a central executive and without the power to raise and spend money, the Continental Congress was essentially handicapped. Couldn't do much at all. And it wasn't very long before that became very apparent. It was most apparent to the, new, the merchant states of New England and the middle colonies, New York, Pennsylvania, and the eastern uh, New England states. Because those states were engaged in the sale and transportation of goods. And that meant if you were a New York merchant and you sold goods to somebody in South Carolina, you had to be able to collect your money from South Carolina. Supposing the South Carolina debtor said, no, I don't want to pay you. I'm not going to pay you for those goods. You cheated me. What do you do? Go to court in South Carolina? And what are your chances of winning a judgment against a South Carolinian in a South Carolina court? Not particularly good. So in 1786, many of the commercial interests in the country issued a call for a convention to be held at Annapolis, Maryland, to decide what to do about this weak Articles of Confederation. And when they met, that convention in turn called for another convention to meet the next year in Philadelphia, 1787, to, quote, revise the Articles of Confederation, end quote. 
There are those people who will tell you that when the Constitutional Convention met in Philadelphia in 1787, it had no authority. That it was only, quote, supposed to revise the Articles of Confederation, unquote. That means that it didn't have the authority to write a new constitution, according to those people. What they miss is the meaning of the word revise in the 18th century. If you think of revise today, what do you think of? You think of to make changes, right? But when you look at the root of the word revise, it means to look again. Re, again, vise, vision, to look again. The word in the 18th century was much closer to its literal meaning. It meant to look over again. You go and revise your notes. So that doesn't mean you edit your notes. It means you look over your notes. That's a term that would be in, in common usage in the 18th century. So that when the call for the convention was, was issued, it did not simply mean that they could make changes in the Articles of Confederation. It meant to look over the Articles of Confederation and do whatever was necessary to make the kind of government that they wanted. Delegates came from all the states to Philadelphia in the summer of 1787. It was terribly hot. They had to keep the doors and windows closed so that uh, the secret meetings couldn't be overheard by anybody. And they sat down and tried to hammer out a new government for the United States, a government that would work better than the Articles of Confederation did. At that Constitutional Convention in 1787, there were many different interests represented. We have all heard, if you study anything about American history, about the compromises between the large states and the small states. The large states, such as Virginia and New York, had a lot of population and wanted the national legislature to be, uh, to be created on the basis of population. That, in other words, if uh, you had more population, you'd have more votes in the legislature. They thought that was only fair. They didn't want to be tyrannized by the small states who had less people making decisions for the large states with more people. At the same time, the small states with less people were afraid that those big monster states would dominate them. And Rhode Island, for example, didn't want to be dominated by New York or Massachusetts. And so the compromise was reached that one house of the new national legislature would be elected by the people, the House of Representatives, according to population in each state. And the other house, the Senate, the upper house, would be made up of two representatives from each state on the basis of geography rather than population. And this is how we got the bicameral legislature of two houses. The Constitutional Convention was also very much aware of the experience of the British. In England, there was only one large authority, Parliament. Parliament had two houses, the House of Lords and the House of Commons. But the Commons had all the taxing power. And you see a reflection of that in the House of Representatives. All money bills, according to the Constitution of the United States, must originate in the House of Representatives, not in the Senate. The Senate was supposed to be more like the House of Lords, more aristocratic, less close to the people. And the idea of a money bill originating in the House is directly associated with the fact that in the Parliament, the money power, the Parliament taxing power is in the House of Commons, not the House of Lords. But there was also something else about the British system that the colonials didn't like. In the British system, the party with the majority in the House of Commons chooses the prime minister, who is the chief executive of the country. In other words, there's no independent chief executive. The chief executive simply depends on the majority in the parliament. At the same time, there is no independent Supreme Court in Britain. The highest court in Britain is the House of Lords, or those members of it known as the Law Lords. This was something that the colonials were very much afraid of. The object of the colonials in building the Constitution was to make a government that would work and that would allow commercial interests to transcend state lines and allow fairness in treatment of one, uh, citizens of one state by treatment of uh, citizens of another state, but at the same time to create a government which would not become a tyranny. At the Constitutional Convention, some of the leading names were James Madison and Franklin, Washington, and these men uh, were very familiar with history. They were also familiar with ancient history, the Greeks and the Romans. And they all knew that the great criticism of democracy is that democracy generate, degenerates into tyranny. The tyranny of the majority is what they were really worried about. Particularly those with money were worried about the tyranny of the majority passing laws that would take away their property. And so they devised a divided government. We have three branches of government independent of each other in our Constitution. The House, of, uh, the House of Representatives and the Senate together form the Congress, the legislative branch. An independent Supreme Court appointed by the President with the consent of the Senate forms an independent judiciary. And the President is elected without regard to the Congress. He's elected on his own and forms a separate executive. And each of these have different terms. The President has a term of four years. The Senators have terms of six years. 
and the members of the House of Representatives have terms of two years, the Supreme Court justices sit for life or good behavior. All this was not done by accident. It was done because the Founding Fathers realized that they couldn't rely on the nature of the people who were going to be in government to be good people and not attempt to become tyrants. And so they attempted to create a system in which the various powers of government would be checked by each other so that nobody could get command of the government too easily, of all the government, and to make a tyranny. Our government is designed not to work terribly efficiently. It's not supposed to be efficient because the object is not efficiency, it's prevention of tyranny. And so the House of Representatives is elected every two years. It's popular, for example, for an issue like flag burning to affect, uh, let's say, to affect the, uh, the composition of the House of Representatives. And let's suppose a great leader arrives of the, uh, arises of the anti-flag burning party. And he wins, uh, his party wins uh, 200 seats in the House of Representatives, let's say. They become a ponderable force. But they don't control the Senate and they don't control the presidency. Two years later, maybe there'll be a presidential election, and let's say the leader of the anti-flag burning party wins the presidency. He now holds the presidency and the House of Representatives, but he still doesn't control the Senate because the senators are elected for six years. It takes at least six years before you can control the Senate. And then, supposing he gets control of that branch of the government, his faction still doesn't control the whole government because the Supreme Court is independent and make uh, hand down decisions which would frustrate his attempt to get control of the whole government. Divided government is the way our government is supposed to operate to prevent tyranny. And so the Constitution was created with that in mind. In the course of the compromises, however, there are a lot more things that happened. The traditional capital of the country had been in Philadelphia, if you recall, and the largest state was Virginia, the most populous state. The southern states in general were the home of the slavery, which by uh, 1780 was a major institution with enormous amounts of money invested in it, land and slaves. And the northern states largely had no slaves. Were something of the, of the slave population of the United States was estimated at about a quarter of a million in 1780. All but about, say, 25,000 were in the southern states. At the Constitutional Convention, the southern states were terribly worried about the power of a new national government which might declare an end to slavery. They felt that would have been the worst thing that could happen to their interests. And so the Constitution is full of hedges designed to protect the southern states from a government that would abolish slavery. You don't even think about them most of the time when you read the Constitution. Why is Washington, D.C. the capital of the United States? The capital had always been in Philadelphia. But at the Constitutional Convention, the uh, southern states demanded that Philadelphia not be the capital of a new United States, that that capital city be built in territory of slave states. The physical capital they demanded be in slave territory. And for that purpose, the states of Maryland and Virginia offered to cede a special district of 30 square miles uh, on the Potomac River. What people don't remember is that Maryland was a slave state, Virginia was a slave state, and those states offered to build that capital there, or to allow that capital to be built there, specifically because they insisted on having it in slave territory. As a sop to the Northerners, they allowed the capital to be in New York for a few years until the national city in Washington was ready. Anybody can tell you that Washington is the world's worst place for a capital. It is so hot in the summer, it is so humid that it is impossible to do any business. In fact, it's impossible to live in Washington, D.C. in the summer. I don't know how anybody does it. Uh, if before air conditioning, it must have been an absolute hellhole in the summer. And yet, the capital of the United States is in Washington, D.C., because the slave states demanded that it be in slave territory. What else? Look in the Constitution and you will see a provision uh, that the slave states may count three-fifths of their slaves for purposes of uh, population to determine the House of Representatives. Now, this doesn't mean that a slave was three-fifths of a man, as commonly thought. A slave was not considered three-fifths of a man. He was a man, all right. But what the Constitution says, as a stop to the southern states, that the southern states could count three-fifths of their slave population for purposes of determining how many representatives they'd have in the House. In other words, it's an artificial increase in the southern strength of the House of Representatives by the amount of three-fifths of the southern slaves, because, of course, the slaves couldn't vote. The slaves were not regarded as people, as civil rights, you know, they didn't have any civil rights in any other way, couldn't vote. But still, the, the southerners were allowed to count them as citizens, three-fifths of their number, for purposes of determining the Southern uh, vote in the House of Representatives. This was designed by the Southerners to prevent the House of Representatives from passing legislation 
over, uh, ending slavery. This, Virginia already was the biggest state, had the most population. The Southerners figured with counting three-fifths of their slaves as well, they would retain control of the House indefinitely, and they'd be protected in the House. So the national capital and the, the uh, House of Representatives were designed to control, uh, to protect uh, slavery. At the, in in uh, 1780, there were at that time 13 original states. The Constitution provided that new states might be made. It also, however, has a provision that no state may be made from another state without that state's permission. Why do you suppose that was there? It was put there to prevent states like New York or Pennsylvania from uh, turning themselves into more states, getting more votes in the Senate, and thus being able to vote against slavery. The Southern states insisted that no state be allowed to be made out of part of another state without permission. And so that provision was inserted in the Constitution. Then there's the Electoral College. As you all know, the President of the United States is not directed, uh, directly elected by the people. He's elected by a special group of people called electors, chosen in each state in time for the presidential election. And they don't have to vote for anybody that the popular vote may choose. The electors choose the president, not the popular vote. In practice, the electors always give their vote to the uh, candidate who wins the popular vote in each state. But in 1780, uh, when the Constitution was passed, 1787, there was no popular vote. The electors chose the president. This was also designed to be a hedge against tyranny. If there was a popular man, such as Napoleon would have become in France, the electors could uh, overwhelm the, overcome the popular, uh, you know, popular favor for a dictator and vote somebody else in to prevent a popular uh, demagogue from becoming president. And that power still exists in the electorate, by the way, in the electors, electoral college. So the Constitution is a very peculiar document. The Southerners figured when, uh, when it was done that they could sign this, that they were protected, and slavery could not be done away with. They made some assumptions, however, when they did this. Number one, that they would always control the House of Representatives. Number two, that uh, because when new states came in, there would be a new slave state for every new free state, and to keep a balance in the Senate. And third, that the President of the United States, elected by the Electoral College, could not be a partial northerner who would eliminate slavery because the Electoral College is based on population. The number of electors you have in the Electoral College in each state is equal to the number of representatives you have in the House of Representatives plus the two senators. And that, again, was inflated for the southern states by that three-fifths rule. So the southerners figured they were pretty well protected. Wouldn't you know, they also made one other assumption that uh, when New Americans came to, the, to America, they would come to the southern states. But this was too cold to live in the north. Nobody would want to go to the north. It was too cold. And so they figured they were really covered. Wouldn't you know, by 1800, they were already proved wrong. Because as immigrants kept coming from England and from elsewhere in Europe, particularly England at this point in Scotland, they didn't want to come to the south. Because if they went south, they'd have to compete with slave labor. Where they went instead, was to the northern colonies and the middle colonies, where there were jobs where they did not have to compete with unpaid slaves. Nobody wants to compete with somebody who doesn't make any money. Why would you hire a, a working man from England if you could have a slave that you, were, you, know, you had bought and you didn't have to pay him? So immigration to America immediately became a factor, and it immediately began to swell the population of the northern states rather than the southern states. And within 20 years after the adoption of the Constitution, Virginia was no longer the largest state in population. New York was. The population began to move heavily into the north, the immigrant population, and the southerners lost control of the House of Representatives within 20 years after they had carefully designed this Constitution to see that they maintained control of it. As new states were admitted, the first new ones to come in were Kentucky and Tennessee, in a couple of slave states, and Vermont, which was a free state, all of which were admitted by 1796. At that point, there were 16 states, eight slave states and eight free states. And from that time on, until 1849, every time a free state came in, a slave state came in with it to maintain that balance in the Senate. There were pairs. Michigan and Alabama, Illinois and Mississippi, uh, Ohio and Louisiana. They came in as pairs. Until later. So in other words, uh, the Constitution was working pretty well, but the Southerners had already lost... A, control of one of their uh, major points of view, uh, the, one of their major protections against the end of slavery. The British, meanwhile, were not particularly impressed with this new nation. And in fact, they regarded it rather as an, uh, a minor irritant and an upstart. And in the course of the British struggle against France, the Napoleonic struggle against France, 
both the British and the French were not too kind to the Americans. The Americans tried to be neutral between the two. The American business was shipping, carrying things from one place to another. The British were interested in preventing any shipping, any trade to going to the colonies, the, to the French, and to going to the continent of Europe. And the French were trying to keep anything from going to the British Isles. Napoleon was trying to blockade Britain. And so both of them seized any kind of neutral shipping that traded with the other, that is to say, American shipping. The British also were not anxious to evacuate some of their frontier posts, which they had captured from the French in 1859, uh, 1759, rather, because they wanted to keep control of Canada and to keep control of those colonies along the eastern coast, make sure that they didn't expand too much and interfere with British interests in Canada and elsewhere. And so comes 1811, 1812, and the American colonies felt that uh, they had not really been uh, recognized, had not really been given their independence, that they were being controlled by the British to the point where they were willing to go to war once again. 1812, in what is uh, called the War of 1812, or Mr. Madison's War, the United States declared war on Great Britain. At the same time, Britain was busy fighting the French. This, of course, was not an accident. The idea being that if the British were tied up fighting Napoleon, that it would be a lot easier for the Americans to win, with, uh, to win their goals. What were the American goals in the War of 1812? Historians have spent a lot of time studying this because it's very interesting. The three air regions of the country, the New England regions, the southern regions, and the backwoods regions, all had different reasons for going to war with the English. It was like three different wars. The New Englanders wanted to go to war because the British were interfering with New England shipping, impressing sailors and stopping ships, taking ships. The Southerners wanted to go to war because the British were interfering with their supplies and cotton to France. And the Westerners wanted to go to war because the British were interfering with their at attempts to move west and gain more land. So the three interests of the country all were anti-British, but none were in accord with each other. And the War of 1812 was a very peculiar war indeed. It was a draw in military terms. Neither side really did much. The Americans invaded Canada and burned what is now Toronto, but the British retaliated by invading Washington and burning that. And in fact, in the course of burning Washington, they burned down the president's house, a mansion that had been built for John Adams in 1797. Uh, they left just about nothing but the smoke blackened walls. And when the Americans got a hold of it again, they had to paint it white in order to cover up all the smoke damage. And it's been the White House from then till now. That's how it got to be the White House in the first place. The War of 1812 brought some stirring uh, conflicts between ships. Uh, on the Atlantic Ocean, American ships defeated British ships in single contact and by, vice versa. On Lake Erie, the American Navy, headed by Admiral Perry, defeated the British on uh, Lake Erie and cleared the lakes for American commerce. And in 1815, Andrew Jackson and his frontiersmen went down to New Orleans and defeated a British force under Sir Edward Pickenham uh, and annihilated it in a stunning defeat. Except for one thing, it wasn't necessary because the war was already over by the time it was fought. It seems that on Christmas Eve, 1814, and the American missionary a mission in, uh, in Belgium and the British mission in Belgium signed a Treaty of Ghent, which ended the war. But because it took so long for the news to get to America, Pickenham attacked New Orleans and Jackson defeated him in a battle that was actually fought after the war was over. The one thing the War of 1815 did do, made no territorial uh, trades between the two countries, did nothing really but to establish that the United States was indeed going to be a separate country and the British were not going to try to control it again. But what it really did was to turn American attention away from Europe and onto the American interior. It's a handy stopping point, uh, stopping point for saying that this is the end, really, of the 18th century history of the United States and the beginning of the modern 19th and 20th century history of the United States of America. <laughs>